Welcome to another edition of A Voice to the Gentile Church. I'm Jim Wingerter. Next to me is Pastor Roger Diaz. Next to him is Dolores Lowe. So we haven't done a program since there was a major attack from Iran on Israel. Yep. It's never said that way, is it? No, it's not. Right. Um, so yes, um, last Shabbat, Iran launched hundreds of missiles and UAVs against Israel. Thankfully, all of them were shot down. Only one person who was a Arab girl, an, an Israeli Bedouin. Arab girl, Bedouin, li yeah. Bedouin, living in a village, was critically injured. So that was the only injury out of this attack. But the, the big questions that are starting to pop up now is, according to the Turkish government, the Biden administration knew that the attack was coming and Biden green-lighted the attack. He told Turkish that as long as they stayed within certain limits. So as the only ally in the region, the only democratic ally in the region of the United States is Israel. And this is how we pay them. This is how we pay our allies, right? We tell their enemies, oh yeah, go ahead. Just, you know, make sure it's not over the top. But go ahead and attack. And that comes on the heels of they're abstaining at the UN Security Council vote on condemning Israel for genocide. So they did that about two weeks ago, right? Simply because Israel's defending itself against Hamas. So let's see, we, the United States, we, we threw a bunch of money at Iran, mm -hmm. 10 billion. Yep. And before that we had thrown 5 billion. Yep. And so now we see Iran dumping some of their old artillery into Israel. And so what does that tell us? That we funded Iran for further development and further inventory. Yes. That's how I see it. Yep. Um, the, the, the situation in the world is so, so corrupt that it's hard to tell exactly where, where the money is coming from, where it's going, who's really behind what. But... Israel, of course, also knew that this was coming. So this must have been based on, on, on U.S. intelligence. Mm -hmm. Had to be. So the whole, the whole thing to look at is how successfully Israel defended herself. Uh, as you know, they have three levels of air right. defense, different altitudes, right? So they have the Iron Dome, which is the lowest of the three different levels. Then they have the uh, David Sling and the right. Arrow. Yep. Whatever they refer to that. Yeah. The and then, Arrow, of course, David Sling, and Iron um, Dome. Pa the Patriot missiles, which are, are really old technology, yeah. Iron Dome, yeah. and now Iron Beam is coming online. Right. And then now Iron B, which is the laser, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's going to be interesting. So, you know, like I said, following that whole thing, we likely saw God's hand in assuring that Israel would defend herself well. But there's another level of defense that Israel has that was not fully revealed on Shabbat, and that is God's hand. Mm -hmm. And so I think we will see that more clearly in the future. And we've seen it before. This is when anomalies occur on the battlefield, things that no one expects, uh, like uh, planes doing, doing things completely in, in, uh, in contrast to what they're designed to do. So we'll see that aspect of Israel's defense before long. Yep. But Israel defended herself well. Now, one of, just, to, just to add to what you're saying or to interject into what you're saying, one of the things that I, that, I, that I see that I expected and I don't like is that evangelicals are getting really hyped up about this. Oh. Um, <laughs> you know, we're really excited about the fact that Israel was successful in defending herself and that we're behind Israel's response now. We should be, Israel should respond forcefully. I'm seeing that with a lot of evangelicals. And I want to tell I want to say that that's wrong. We should never be, be supporting any aggression in terms of war. Israel will do what they have to do. But we as the evangelicals, we ought to step away from that. Because the truth is, we're really excited about Israel's strong response. Because it's pointing to the end of our stay on earth and that's really behind that so for that purpose we we evangelicals should stay out of that aspect of it 
you know, pray for Israel. How many of all the people that prayed for Israel's defense on Shabbat, how many Christians were praying in, in the effect that we would be raptured out of here and Israel would then respond forcefully? I mean, it's, it's bizarre. We should never be in that place. We should support Israel, right. absolutely. There's but we shouldn't be looking forward. We shouldn't be hawks looking forward to some great, you know, apocalyptic war. There's something. a thing going around Facebook that uh, for Christians that's basically saying Israel's the measuring rod, the timeline. Right. Uh, yeah. it's, 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 they're falling back into that whole pre-tribulation <laughs> rapture contraption, and it's hard. It's difficult to rationalize you wanting. A great war between Iran, you know, you're looking for Gog and Magog. Why? Because you want to be raptured out of here. It, we Christians, we evangelical Christians should never be in that place. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't envy Bibi because if Israel does not respond, then it opens itself to more attacks and not right. just from Iran, right? from all other nations. They need to go after all the drones that are sitting on the ground right. waiting to be used in the next oh, attack. Israel I, will respond. A whole lot more than Israel that. absolutely will respond. <laughs> There's no question yeah. about it. Um, and <coughs> there are, like Saudi Arabia came out and said that um, they believe that the, the reason Tehran attacked Israel was really to destabilize the relationship that's starting to bud between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Saudi Arabia is saying that? Yeah. Because apparently their their relationships were their relationship was starting to normalize, and by creating this problem, you now have everything going crazy, and and it's kind of true because Jordan allowed Israeli planes mm. to go over Jordanian airspace well, in order king, to shoot down King uh, what's his name the King of Jordan Abdullah King, king, king Abdullah yeah I think he's Abdullah right? his daughter was one of the fighters who oh, went yeah. up and shut down yep. Uh, missiles yep so. More to come because it's the Middle East, but it is, I don't envy that because the response, when we say the response could trigger World War III, the response could certainly trigger World War III yeah. because you have Russia and China saying, hands off Iran. We have probably the weakest administration in the U.S. ever. I mean, the only, the only administration I can compare to this one is Chamberlain during World War II. Right? Mm. Remember, peace in our time, right? It's worse than that. I mean, Dolores, actually, our administration, we're not benign. We're nope. very nope. potent. It's not like Chamberlain who just, you know, he, he mm. wants to buy time. Yeah. We're not weak. Nope. We're incredibly influential and we're pulling strings. We're throttling entire nations. We're behind the conspiracies that are actually going to ultimately turn against Israel. Yeah. I mean, look at what we're doing in, in between Russia and the Ukraine, we're very much involved yep. there, and we're playing both sides of it. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, it, it. This country is, is in a place where it should never be. Yep. I do not understand the foreign policy. Oh. We are paying yeah. right now for both sides of every major yeah. conflict in the world, Because right? we're doing what the globalists have been aspiring to do for decades, which is control uh, all of the affairs of the nations, financial, economically, mm -hmm. and, and militarily, where the globalists are succeeding through Washington, D.C. Yeah. And I mean, let's remember how we got here, right? The wonderful Obama nuclear deal. Remember the pallets of money we dropped on the runway? But, you um, know, we like to pick on Obama, but this goes yo. way, way beyond Obama. Obama was just, like I always say, a clever puppet. Um, the puppeteers are the ones we should look at, the same people who began talking about, through Nixon, another puppet, about a new world order, mm -hmm. you know, bringing the entire world into one order. That's what we're seeing. Yep. I mean, how, how do you instigate a war with Russia through the Ukraine, fund the Ukraine, and they want to fund the Ukraine soon with $100 right. billion, dollars, yep. and, and, and then have all that money funneled back into your own pockets and have this incredible cycle of corruption. Mm -hmm. How do you get away with that? Yep, I, the sad thing is the first bucket of money, the first large bucket of money that went to Ukraine did not go to the war. No. It went to paying down the Ukrainian national debt. That's right. So we incurred debt so that Ukraine mm -hmm. could pay off their national debt. And when you get behind what that initial debt was all about, it was about corruption. Right, yes. Paybacks yes. And, kick, and kickbacks. And kickbacks, yeah. And then the result of the Iran nuclear deal that we were told left and right we needed to have, 
And when Trump pulled out, the Europeans went nuts saying that it would cause all sorts of problems and all this stuff, is that the Institute for Science and International Security, which is an institute that assesses the state of nuclear weaponry across the world yeah. has said that Iran is now at the period necessary for Iran to assemble a <clears> nuclear <throat> weapon is in essence at zero, which means that in the next 30 days, Iran could put a weapon together. What Americans don't know, because it's not broadcast, is that not only did we promise the Iranians money, we allowed Russian nuclear scientists yeah access into Iran to help Iran. Explain to me, if you're trying to stop a nuclear program, why would you send nuclear scientists to them? So put the pieces together. You did this thing, you initiated this thing, and then you sent them $10 billion mm -hmm. with, the, with the promise of more funding. Yep. Oh, and you on. lifted the sanctions on oil, so they're now selling two, 2 million barrels of oil a day, primarily to China, our enemies. Because what no is, what's a barrel going for these days? Like one hundred and twenty-ish, one hundred and fifty, yeah. yeah, somewhere in there. So they're making some hefty money off of their oil right now. I mean, the level of corruption. You know, it's no wonder that God, God's wrath will mm -hmm. be kindled heavily against the nations, and this nation is at the helm of it. Yep. You know, we're leading the nations into this global configuration. It's incredible what we're seeing today. A lot of people are. You know, people that are back to the pre-tribulationist conundrum, people that are pre-tribulationists, they're just looking for war, right? Nuclear war, that's it, that's our ticket. Uh, but people that are more biblically minded and our perspective is broad, we see the, the, the minutia of all of this. We see the, the details of all of this. We see the nation's positioning to become the ten horns, you know, this club of Rome stuff. Mm -hmm you know, World Economic Forum people that are, that are vehemently committed to bringing about 10 divided kingdoms around the world, 10, 10 regional nations. To us, we're seeing the most broadest picture of the whole thing. We're seeing the whole Antichrist government, the beast, coming into formation. And we can rightly then, therefore, divide the, the words of the prophets based on that. People that are pre-tribulationists, again, they're all excited right now because yep. they're seeing the prospect of tribulation, the war, the antichrist, the third temple, their focus is narrow and skewed. I, I, why am I yeah. beaten up on this? I have no idea. Go no, ahead. no, I mean, it's, it's a sad commentary. I have a friend who is totally pre-trib, right? Uh, so and tell she me about, actually told me one time uh -huh. that what did she care what was going that's on? Right. She was going to be raptured out that's of here. The, that's and exactly I went. the sentiment. Yeah. That's the, that's the sentiment. Now, Tell me about Mar Mari Emmanuel. You know you, yep. you, you know who he is. So he is a Assyrian priest, mm -hmm. um, Orthodox priest in Australia. Coptic, yeah. yeah, Coptic. Oh, okay. Catholic priest. Yeah. Mm. No, well, it's it's the Assyrian <laughs> Orthodox Church, right? Yeah. Um, and he was in church giving his sermon, and a 16-year-old Arab came in with a knife and started stabbing him. Yeah. Um, the congregation rose up and actually cut the kids I think off. I think before you, you <laughs> say that um, I think the, the truth is going to come out if you look at the video the the, 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 the terrorist went after him the knife mm -hmm. was not open completely mm -hmm. and he started uh, striking him mm -hmm. and then he looked up at the knife you can see it on the video he looked up at the knife and he flicked it what he was doing was the knife was not adjusted he was cutting his own hand oh. when he tried to stab him so Mar Mardi, Mar Mari didn't receive as many stabs as it looks like because the, the kid was actually cutting himself mm -hmm. with the knife. And then, of course, they held him down, yeah. and uh, one, of his, one of his fingers was severed. An amazing story because the, the Assyrians in diaspora, as we say Assyrians, mm -hmm. they are Assyrians, but they, they're, you know, they're from northern Iraq. They're descended from the Assyrian people, the Arameans. They were, they were pushed out after the, uh, the Gulf War, right? I mean, right. it became yes. impossible for mm -hmm. them to be there. And they're so divided up, so many different tribes of these Arameans. And many of them went to Australia. So in Australia, there's a huge Aramean community, or Assyrian community, also in Miami as well, and other parts of the world. So what happened? 
when this Muslim went after Ma Mari uh, and they, they subdued him, well, you know that Mari or Ma Mari Emmanuel, what is his right name? What's Ma Mari Emmanuel. Yeah, Ma Mari Emmanuel. I don't know what his, true, <laughs> what his real name is. But, you know, he actually got up and laid hands on the kid and yes, prayed he, for Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And, and prayed for, for the kid's uh, salvation. Anyway, so but, mm -hmm. instantly this, his, his message was being uh, live streamed. Mm -hmm. Instantly, the whole community was in front of this yep. church, Good Shepherd yes. Church yes. in Western Sydney. And they, they were calling for this guy to, to be brought out. Yep, they, they, was, were. They, were, they were. They were yelling claiming an eye for an eye. An eye. Yep. And they were prepared to take action. Um, of course, they ended up coming against the Australian police. Yeah. So well, it's well, an amazing thing that this happened. Now, why this happened? Back in February, Ma Mari gave a, gave a, a talk from his pulpit about uh, basically about the different nations of the world and he was making the point that uh, there's only Jesus Christ, there is no Krishna, there's no Muhammad and he really elaborated on the, the reality of Islam being uh, an, apost an apostate religion mm -hmm. and he made, he's very bold and this is what I admire about him, he's very bold, he's very orthodox and on and, and a lot of points I won't agree with him but very bold and very correct in many aspects of Bible prophecy, which I, which I admire. But after he gave that talk back in February, uh, the, he was threatened. He said he has two weeks to live. So here we are in April, April 15th, I think is when right. it happened. Mm -hmm. And they attempted to take his life. Well, today the Australian police labeled it terrorism, right? Yeah. So. Well, see, what happened now, an interesting thing happened, I followed it. It was a, a, a lady officer who, first on the scene, came right out and said in front of all the cameras that this was a Muslim uh, mm -hmm. terrorist attack. The, 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 the uppers in the department <laughs> wanted to quiet it right. and not present it as an actual Islamic terrorist attack. But this, this particular officer came right out and said it, so it was too late. Uh, the so-called cat was out of the bag. One, two, the assailant was recorded saying Allahu Akbar, Allahu mm -hmm. Akbar, as he was trying to stab Mar Mardi. Mardi did, did receive some stab wounds, but a lot of what you see there is just the, the, the back of the knife pounding on him. Mm. Uh, the kid basically cut his finger off. Yeah, and then um, the local mosque in the area now mm. has security They're afraid. Protection. They're afraid. They're afraid, right. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. now have security. Because they're the victim. Exactly. <laughs> As yeah. if they didn't know that this was coming. Exactly. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh. Um, and then uh, moving on to the sad state of the United States, right? So you're going to give a state of the union. This is the speech. real state of the union. The real address. state of the union. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you know that they have been doing the whole moral equivalence thing of, oh, just because of October seventh, you know, Israel's now committing genocide in Gaza and all that, right? Totally ignoring that these were innocent civilians who were not only kidnapped, but many of them were, 1,200 of them were killed in some of the most horrible ways possible, right? So we're seeing students at major universities, you know, I'm at the point that if you send your child to an American university, particularly a public one, you're committing child abuse because mm. your child is coming home as something you will never recognize, right? So when, when the whole Iran attack on Israel happened, and Israel pushed back and, and was very successful against Iran, there started to be all sorts of um, demonstrations, particularly in Michigan, Wisconsin, that area of the country, you know, where it's mini jihad, jihad city, right? Um, and they started chanting, not just death to Israel, they also started chanting death to America. Yeah. The sad thing is, it took Governor Gretchen Whitmer, you know, that lovely lady, right? A whole week to condemn the shouts of death to America. So she's still governor of New York? Uh, no, no, um, Michigan. Oh, Michigan, I'm yeah. sorry, yeah. It took her a whole yeah. week to come out and say that that was wrong. And then... Well, it's nice that she finally did. 
I'm, I'm sure it doesn't ride well with her constituency. Yeah, I hope. Well, she's got no. she's got all those Arabs, right? What's right. really going on here is Michigan is the linchpin for the next election. It is. There is no path for either side to win if they don't win Michigan. And the Biden administration is in trouble because all of the Muslims in, in Michigan are refusing to vote for him because of all this, you know, this weird stance, because well, I can't say he's pro-Israel, really, pseudo, right? Pseudo support for Israel. Right, that, that fake support. He's Ironclad. Yeah. And what did he I'm say? I'm right behind what did, you. What did he say to, to Iran? Don't. 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 <laughs> <laughs> like, that's going to scare anybody. Right? <laughs> so... Because that is going on. He surely never was in a schoolyard Man, fight. He made he made Clint, Clint Eastwood jealous for that statement. <laughs> what a one-liner. Don't. <laughs> so, because they know that there is no path to victory without winning Michigan, they are reluctant to say anything or do anything. It's, it's that whole thing of they will let the country burn down so long as they can stay in power. That's what it's really all about, right? If it burns, there's nothing to be in power over. Yeah, but they don't care. They just want to be in power and they'll let everything burn to the ground to, to do that. This administration is such a kabuki show. It's, it's a, it is. It it's is insane. It is an amazing specter that's yeah. being played out before the entire world. You know, yesterday. What a shame. Yeah, yesterday. People flying out of O'Hare, Chicago O'Hare, one of the largest airports in the nation, yes. had to stop outside of the airport, grab their luggage, and walk to the airport because the Muslim protesters were out there with their chance of death to America, death to Israel, and were blocking all traffic into the airport. So tell me, the framers of the Constitution... Oh, they're turning in their graves. When the first, admi the first amendment mm -hmm. was, was presented concerning free speech, freedom of speech. Do you think they envisioned anything like this? Nope. This would never, ever have entered into their minds. Oh, you, I, think about it. Ten years ago, would you have thought that this country would be in this state ten years ago? Yeah, I would have. Really? Absolutely. I mean, I know things were bad, but I didn't no, think it was going to get this I, bad. I had an entirely pessimistic view of where things were going. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely horrendous, and it's absolutely horrendous <clears throat> that we as a nation can't do anything morally right or even just right because we have people in power who are corrupt or are so interested in power that they right. will do anything to keep that power. When I was a kid and Nixon was president and there were riots all over the place in Kent State and the mm -hmm. whole mess yep. and the students who were killed there, and my mother said, could it possibly ever get any worse yeah. than this? Right. Absolutely. And that was 67, it's, 68. So here, here is the, the good news. It's going to get worse. <laughs> it's going to get worse it's, than what we're seeing now, much worse. It's so bad that, you know, think tanks that are doing intelligence assessments for the next war or the next conflict and that involves the U.S., right, like real U.S., right, not proxy U.S. where we're sending people behind the scenes, but where they have to take into account the amount of unrest civilly in the nation to determine whether they can even fight, fight a war against yeah. an external aggressor because it's just so bad. It's unbelievably bad. So anyway, good news for Dale because Dale likes good news. Um, so there were four Marines down in the area of Micronesia, and they took a boat out and they got stranded on a desert island, right? And unfortunately, they didn't have the, you know, the little beacons that go on the boat that, that signal where they're at, right? So the Coast Guard is out looking for them, and they can't find them and all that stuff. So they got the bright idea, think of Gilligan's Island, to write help using palm fronds on the sand, the huge help sign. And thanks to that help sign, they were actually recovered. Wow. So low-tech, Gilligan's Island style, and they got recovered. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for them. Mm -hmm. They survived. So we have a good question. All right. So let's, I'll just read it. The prophets Zechariah and Joel both pointed to a time when all the nations will come against Israel 
and God will then judge all the nations. If this is actually going to happen, who are, quote, the nations of Zechariah 14 and Revelation 20 that seems to exist in the millennium reign of, the, of Christ? Okay. So, yeah, it's a, it's a good question, provides for a good uh, topic, a good discussion. So, at the base of this is erroneous concepts of what the end of the age is all about. Uh, we've been sort of conditioned to see the, the, the end of this age as the end of the world. And that all of the nations would be sort of obliterated. King James translation makes that statement, the end of the world. Yeah, of course, it's the end of an epoch. Right, you know. right. As I said on Sunday, it's a turning of a page. We're in a new. We're approaching a new chapter. Now, the the reality of the Bible gives us a whole entirely different picture, which is what we're going to talk about. So, the nations at the end of the age. What what we're going to see and what the Bible gives us is that, yes, all of the nations will in fact come up to Zion, come up against Israel. And the prophets are clear on that. And so maybe we should read what the prophets say about that. And uh, we have three, three references there. J um, Jim, if you can read those three references. Just to illustrate that, yes, there's going to be a multinational uh, a martyr, an effort on the part of these, all the nations to come up against Israel. And God will meet them and God will bring judgment upon them. So if you can read those three references. Sure. Jim. We're going to start with Zechariah 12. Mm -hmm. The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. And it will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. So Zechariah is very clear. All the nations will come up against Jerusalem, Zion, and in Bible prophecy, more often than not, Zion is synonymous with the people of Israel. And so clearly there's going to be a, a universal, a global effort to, to strike Jerusalem, to, to come against the people of Israel. Yep. Also in Isaiah 14. Uh, 24 to 27. Mm -hmm. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, just as I have intended, so it has happened. Just as I have planned, so it will be it will stand to break Assyria in my hand in my land, and I will trample him on my mountains. Then his okay, so pause right there. So the Prophet Isaiah has seen something that's contemporaneous to his time, something that's about to happen during his time which is the Assyrian coming up to Samaria and, and all that the Assyrians did. It was Isaiah who prayed against Sennacherib, the great Assyrian king and his army, and this incredible thing happened that we see in Isaiah chapter 35 to 39. So he's pointing to something that was, again, contemporaneous. But then he, the statements that will follow are pressing forward into the future. So, so read the other verses for us. To break Assyria in my land... And I will trample him on my mountains. Then his yoke will be removed from them, and his burden removed from their shoulder. This is the plan devised against the whole earth. Right. And this is the hand that is stretched out against all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has planned, mm -hmm. and who can frustrate it? And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? So... This is a very important block of scripture. Now, I'll define a little closer as we move on to Joel chapter 3, 1 to 3. God, this is, this is Isaiah chapter 14. This is some years before Sennacherib uh, came up to Jerusalem. God had appointed the Assyrians to prevail against the northern kingdom and to take Samaria. So Sargon II, 
uh, succeeded to take uh, Samaria and, and did what he did. It was maybe maybe 50 years or so later, maybe around 50 years later, Sennacherib now decides that he's going to encroach upon Judah. He came up against Lachish, and he laid siege to Lachish, and eventually succeeded against Lachish. Lachish gave him a much, a much stronger fight than he expected. And then he said, this is what Sennacherib said, I have a standing army, the world's first standing army, um, professional soldiers, never were there an army like that before. He invented that whole idea. He said, well, I'm here. I've got a standing army. I'll just go up to Jerusalem and take Jerusalem. I'm in the neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> and so he took his army of 180,000 men, surrounded Jerusalem, most of them in the Kidron Valley, and decided that he was going to breach the walls of Jerusalem. King Hezekiah cried out to God, and Isaiah was sent to him, and Isaiah said to King Hezekiah, I am going to destroy this army. And he said some other things, but basically God said to, to, to King Hezekiah, to Isaiah, I'm going to destroy this army. But Isaiah had prophesied about this years before in Isaiah chapter 14, that he would break the Assyrian army on his hill on, in, in Jerusalem, which is exactly what happened. Because the next morning, which was Passover, mm -hmm. this happened on the night of Pesach, the next morning when everyone got up, the entire army was broken. The 180,000 Assyrian men laid waste in the Kidron Valley. So God fulfilled his promise clearly. But then in Isaiah chapter 14, before this incredible thing happened, he prophesied concerning what he will do with all the nations, that he will do the same, right? That's what we just saw, right, right. that what happened with the Assyrians on his mountains, he will do the same with all the nations. You know, Bible scholars and so on, they, 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 they have an asphyxiation with this story concerning Sennacherib. What happened? Just to ensure that the nations will know that God did what he did, with the Assyrians, and it's prophetic to what he will do with all the nations, a stele was discovered in, in Nineveh, ancient Nineveh, which is basically a wall carving about, about maybe 40 feet across, 45 feet, uh, 18 feet tall. Massive stele that was done by the sons of Sennacherib. After Sennacherib realized that his army was decimated by God, he went back to Assyria and his sons assassinated him. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he was a failure. Right. But to ensure that he didn't lose too much face, they, they made the stele. And the stele was about the, 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 the Jerusalem affair. How he lost an army of 180,000 men, professional soldiers, at the hands of the God of Israel. And they portrayed it. Right. So they found, archaeologists found this stele about maybe 120 years ago. And so they had this huge dilemma, these scholars who are not people of faith, they had a huge dilemma. <laughs> how, do we, how do we negotiate this, this story that we see in Isaiah with the stele? The stele seems to confirm this. We have to interject our opinion. So, <laughs> yes. and, and sort of nullify any faith and sort of uh, you know, neuter the God of Israel. And so what happened was they came to the conclusion initially that... What happened in Jerusalem was actually a plague of mice mm. overnight. That, <laughs> that while everyone was sleeping, the army was preparing for invasion of Jerusalem the next morning, uh, a mice, this plague of mice, uh, brought, brought some sort of an, an infection into the valley and everyone died, with the exception of Sennacherib, yeah. of course. Instantaneous death there. That right there, didn't make ever. a noise. <laughs> everyone woke up and everyone's dead. It didn't affect anyone in Jerusalem, right? right? Yeah. As if the mice couldn't <laughs> climb over the wall. So, yeah, and, and they, they settled on that for about 40, 50 years. But then they came up with a secondary, additional uh, uh, conclusion as to what happened. They ended up saying that it wasn't mice necessarily. It was a phantom Ethiopian army that came up from Ethiopia, a million men, and they descended in the valley and destroyed the Assyrians and fled right back 
to Phantom. No one saw it. That's Those why there's no report Ethiopians. of it. Yeah. Perfect timing. That's they why, knew that was going to happen. That's why there's no report of it in the Bible or on the stele. <laughs> These were Phantom soldiers who came in, mercenaries, and just destroyed the whole army. So why is everyone surprised when they woke up the next morning on Pesach and saw the entire army decimated? Wouldn't a, wouldn't a phantom army have made a noise? Mm -hmm. I would think. These are scholars that came up with those theories. Um, now, the point is, why are they so aggressive concerning coming up with some sort of a justification to prove that what happened in that valley was not the hand of God? I'll tell you why. Because of the prophecy that Jim just read, it's, God made a very clear statement. What, what I'm going to do with the Assyrians on my mountains I will do with all the nations. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, common. it's, it's yeah. a spiritual opposition that brings these people to the conclusion that they have to nullify what happened with the Assyrians, with Sennacherib. Right, so, so let's see what Joel says. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Yehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they have divided up my land. All right, so that's, you can't, you can't, you can't misplace anything that you just read. Right. It's very clear. God is going to judge all the nations because of the nation's interaction with Israel, dividing up his land. I mean, really, uh, aren't, aren't the United Nations, uh, yep. the global order, Biden, and they're trying to, and, and they now trying to divide up the land. Of course, yes. all of the maneuvering that we see with the Biden administration on behalf of the globalists is about the hope that they can introduce the Levant. And the Levant is the epitome of the land of Israel being divided. Because with the, with the Levant, you don't have an Israel. Israel is no, no longer a nation if you can introduce the concept of the Levant. So the prophets all saw this. So does it mean that God's going to, as many think, bring the world to an end and destroy all the nations? I've heard Bible, Bible prophecy people talk about that we're going to be raptured out of here. The church is, the Holy Spirit is going to be taken um, seven years of tribulation, all the nations will be completely destroyed, except Israel. This is, this is what I've heard. Except Israel, and Israel is going to be here for a millennial kingdom. Now, I've heard one prominent Bible teacher say exactly what I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to paraphrase him. He said, in regards to Israel, I don't know what God's going to do with Israel during the millennial kingdom, but he's going to do something. But I'm not going to be here. I'm going to heaven. So, this is a this is a, a real a real theological position. So the idea that only Israel will survive during the millennial kingdom, and what is God going to do with Israel during the millennial kingdom? Who knows? Who cares? We're going well, to heaven. All they have to do is open their Bible and read it. <laughs> but who wants to confuse the issue with the facts, <laughs> right? And the facts are what we see in the Bible. When we want our fantasy hard pressed. No, right. Exactly. Yeah. Precisely. So the reality is, yes, God will judge all the nations, but not the people. You see, it's been a long time since nations of this world has truly enjoyed their sovereignty because their sovereignty has been given over to one governing body of people. And this governing body of people is making for themselves one name. Remember the story of Babel, right, mm -hmm. and Nimrod? Right. Babel, the people of Babel. Nimrod wanted to make one name of all the peoples, one authority, in other words. And the Bible refers to this one name that will be established as the beast. The Bible names the authority as the beast. So there's going to be a governmental structure that the Bible refers to as a beast that will take authority, authority over all humanity. They have a grand design for humanity, dividing the world into 10 regional national entities, 10 nations, right? These are the 10 horns that we see on the beast of Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 13. It's too vivid to ignore it. So yes, there's going to be 
uh, an authority representing all the nations that will come up against Israel. That beast, that name, that authority will be completely obliterated. God will bring that, that authority to a complete end. In fact, what we see in Revelation chapter 19 is Jesus will come and he will seize the beast and that other authority with it, the false prophet, and everyone who has taken the mark of the beast, and he will cast them into the lake of fire. Yeah. That's the dismal ending of this world system. But it does not mean that all of the nations will be obliterated. It means that the, the, the authority figure that has taken possession of all the nations right. will be completely destroyed. Right. So the idea is that, for instance, the people of this country and the people of every country is supposed to constitute the government Correct. of the, the nations that we're talking about. For instance, the way that this country is supposed to, uh, uh, you know, a, a constitutional republic, um, we're supposed to be a country of the people, by the people, for the people. Well, that's been horribly perverted, right? Yes. So my point is, when Yeshua comes and he establishes this millennial kingdom, he's going to put an end to that governmental system, the beast. But the, un the people of this United States will continue to live on, mm -hmm. those who will not take the beast. Now, we don't know what that ratio would be. Uh, I, I venture to say that there would be many Americans, U.S. citizens, that will not take the, the mark of the beast and will not necessarily be in Messiah. What is that number? Who knows? Right. A million, 10 million, who knows? But there will be a number. And so you will have Canadians, you will have Americans, you'll have Mexicans, maybe small numbers of them. We're going to read here in Zechariah. Zechariah literally said, those who are left of all the nations that came up against Jerusalem, right? So we don't know what that number will be, but I will venture to say that the number will be a small ratio, mm -hmm. a percentage of humanity will remain following God's judgment of the beast and constitute or reconstitute what the nations will be. All right, so, so yes, uh, God is going to bring judgment against the nations. He will entirely and completely judge the nations, but not the people necessarily. They will go on to exist during the millennial kingdom and will constitute the nations. During the millennial kingdom, we're talking about a paradise on earth. That's what the millennial kingdom is. It is literally an earthly paradise. The, the presence of Jesus being the person of God in the earth, together with the bride, during this period, will radically transform even the physical landscape of the earth during this period. It's going to be something like we've never seen before. Now, that's the millennial kingdom. So those who are left concerning the judgment that's coming, that Joel talked about, that, that Isaiah talked about, that Zechariah talked about, those who are left will become the nations, who will walk in his light, the light of his ministry in the earth. His ministry in the earth will be projected or presented through himself. Yeshua himself will reign, on the, reign in the earth. He will be a, a picture of God himself. He's the image of the invisible God. He will reign in the earth on behalf of the Father's kingdom, and we will reign with him. And we are talking about a, a, a literal paradise. So Zechariah chapter 14, Jim, let's read that. Uh, verse verse uh, 16. Verse 16, yes, sir. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. This is during the Millennial Kingdom. Right. How do we know this is during the Millennial Kingdom? Because they're coming to the king. Right. But and the, and what else? How do we know that there's a sequential development here and this is coming after? It's, it's after they fought survives. against Jerusalem. There's a great battle, right? right. Zechariah chapter yeah. 12 right. and 13 yeah. mm -hmm. concerning Jerusalem. We know how that battle is going to end, right? right? God's going to destroy the nations. And then at the end of that battle, we see Jesus' feet 
landed on the Mount of Olives. The valley was split east to west. Water, living water, will come up from that valley, the Kidron Valley, and it will make its way into the Dead Sea. Life comes to a dying world. What a wonderful picture of who Jesus is, right. life. And so the kingdom is established at that point. And then the nations, those who are left, left from what? From the, from battle. the battle. From this great battle, as, Zach right. as Zachariah said, who came up against Jerusalem, will come up to Jerusalem once a year to celebrate the Feast of Boots, mm -hmm. Sukkot. And then yeah. it says, in Egypt, when she doesn't come up. <laughs> Any of the nations who refuse, if there's rebellion, in other right, words, right. in this millennial kingdom period, well, then God right. will deal with them. Right. I mean, in a loving way. But sure, he will deal with they them. have no rain they for a no time. Rain. So we see here that clearly the nations are in existence. But we're pointing to a millennial kingdom. And I want to put the emphasis on this millennial kingdom, the wonder of this millennial kingdom. What we're going to see here in, in Isaiah chapter 11, I'm going to read 1 to 9. What we're going to see here is that this kingdom is unlike anything that has ever existed. Perhaps the last time anything like this has ever existed is in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, yeah. The Eden period. Now, this comes as the Messiah, as Yeshua, his ministry is established in the earth. And that's what, that's what Isaiah chapter 11, 1 to 5 is about. And then it goes 6 to 9, giving us a picture of this millennial kingdom, this paradise. It is literally a paradise. The land of Israel will be like a garden, like the Garden of Eden, again, during this period. It's, it's pointing back to what existed before the fall. And it's also pointing forward to what will exist following the millennial kingdom. Right. Because we know how the millennial kingdom ends, right? Right. Yes. The, the, the war that evangelicals are looking for, Gog and Magog, will actually happen at the end of the millennial the end, kingdom, right. according to the actual Bible. Right. So these, these hyper eschatological evangelicals, and I'm an evangelical Christian, I consider myself to be one, but I'm educated by the Bible. The Bible is my education. Right. I haven't bought into a Jesuit concept of a pre-tribulation rapture that has corrupt my thinking. Right. So I'm free to see the Bible in its own light. No. Gog and Magog comes at the end of the millennial kingdom. You can't get much more clearer than what we see in Revelation right. chapter 12. Right. No, you can't say that there are two Gogs and Magogs. One before the millennial kingdom. You can't say that. <laughs> no. no. Because what comes before the millennial kingdom is clear. It's Armageddon. It's a different battle. Yeah. An entirely different battle. Comes on a different construct. No, let's read. Isaiah 11 is one of, the, one of the most wonderful chapters in all the Bible. It really points to the kingdom of Jesus, Yeshua, in the earth. And let's read. Then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his root will bear fruit. The stem there, the, the root, the shoot there is the branch. Mm -hmm. The word branch there is Natsur Not in, the, in, in Isaiah chapter 11. The word Zemach is also used for branch. So a branch, a nat, sir, a branch from his root will bear fruit. The spirit, of, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Now that's something that's dreadfully missing today, the fear of the Lord, right? Right. Does the Bible tell us anything about the fear of the Lord? It is the beginning of understanding. Wisdom, correct, but it's much more than that. Mm -hmm. I fear God because I love God. I fear God because I don't want to let him down. I obey him because I love him. I have fear for God. And Jesus said something that's relevant. He said, what did he say? Don't fear the one that can kill the body, but fear the one that can cast both body and soul into eternal fire. So yes, I fear God, but it's not a fear of dread, a foreboding fear. I love him. I have no question I am not going to be thrown into the lake of fire. By faith, I know that I will reign with his son. And for that reason, I am awed by him. And I want to please him. I fear my natural man turning against him. You follow me? Yes. Mm -hmm. I fear what my natural self can do in opposing him. And I fear him. And for that reason, I love him and I obey him. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. 
and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. Wonderful. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. Now that's Revelation chapter 19 material right there. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. What is the rod of his mouth? The word of God. The word of God, the the sword of the spirit. So we're talking sword of the spirit activity here. He's going to bring judgment, yes. But he's going to do this with fairness. And with the bread of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Also, the righteous will be a belt about his loins. And righteousness will be a belt about his loins. And faithfulness, a belt, a, a belt a, about his waist. Then it goes on. So this is the Messiah. Mm-hmm. This is the righteous one, the branch, who will bear fruit. He will reign in the earth. He will judge with fairness. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will judge based on what the word of God has already declared. He will judge the poor with righteousness. He will decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will judge the wicked. We're talking about the beast here. Mm -hmm. He will judge those who are conspiring against humanity, conspiring against Israel. You talked about the bird flu development, right? Yes. What's happening there? So the USDA, in collaboration with the Chinese government, is doing scientific experiments to create a stronger, faster bird flu, right? Why do we need such a thing? Great question. All right. <laughs> so we're not going to get into that. We right. know, be, uh, between us here, we know what's going I'm, I'm sure they're preparing multiple vaccines mm-hmm. and boosters for it as well. All right. So they have a plan. Yes. They have a grand plan. God has a plan as well. God's plan has been stated in the word, and God's plan will not fail. Their plan will unravel right before them. So God's going, that, this is why, you know, a lot of people say, you know, I can't understand why Jesus has to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. Why does he have to bring judgment? I, I, that's not the Jesus I want. Mm. Well, yeah. when, when God sends his son to bring judgment, he is just. Right, yes. right. Because of the evil that will be perpetuated, perpetuated by humanity. God is just when he brings judgment. The wicked will be judged. Now, let's take a look at this millennial kingdom. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. A boy, a little boy, will lead them. That's, so what, a, what a picture. Animals are functioning in, in ways that are, that are contrary to the fallen nature. They're suddenly functioning in the way that they were designed to function. And a little boy will lead them. You know, humanity, we've been positioned by God to lead his creation, right? To be stewards of his creation. Here, a little boy, a child, is going to be a steward of these animals during this period. We're back to perfect order, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Also, the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. What 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 a scene that will be. And the lion will eat straw like an ox. The nursing child will play with the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child will put his hand on a viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full, will be full with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And there's more we can say about this, but we want at this point. God is bringing about a picture of perfection, and he's going to place that right on the mountains of Judea and Samaria. It may not be that particular way throughout the earth, but Judea and Samaria becomes a stage on which God's going to project his perfect order on that mountain. And from that mountain, he will reign over the entire world. And that's what the prophet is saying. The world, the entire world, will be filled with the knowledge of God because of what he had had established on that holy mountain. A perfect order with his son, the king himself, Yeshua, reigning on that mountain, and a royal priesthood. This is the condition that we're going to see in this new millennial kingdom, this, this kingdom that's coming upon the earth. It is a picture of perfection. And it's going, to be, it's going to be there to say to the nations, you know, the law will go forth from Zion. 
the word of God from Jerusalem. That's what Isaiah talked about earlier. Well, this is the condition under which uh, the new millennial kingdom will be established. Now, the, 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 the Jewish people, Jewish scholars and so on, they don't have much of a concept of a millennial reign of the Messiah in the earth. Why? Because the idea of a millennial reign, actual 1,000 year reign, is found in, in, uh, in Revelation chapter 20, right? That's where it comes from. Okay, but they do know that there is coming such a kingdom. Right. And when the Messiah comes, he will establish such a kingdom from their point of view. Now, we in Messiah, we know that Jesus is the Messiah. We feel pretty sure that we're right, right? Now, that's based on our revelation. But the facts of the kingdom are the same. The Messiah will come. He will reign. He will be the, the root, the Zemach, the, the Natsur of Jesse, the promise concerning uh, uh, the son of David. He will be. He will reign and rule in righteousness. He will establish justice for the poor. He will judge the wicked. And he will establish a, a, a faithful kingdom in the earth, a 1,000-year kingdom. And during this period, the mountains of Israel will become again a stage on which God's going to project perfection. I love the Hebrew word mushlam because the Hebrew, the Hebrew word mushlam is perfect, but it's also shalom, it's complete. And, and when we think of peace, we think of, you know, the word shalom being peace, meaning an absence of conflict. But that's not what the word shalom means. The word shalom means whole, complete. So I asked the question, what does the number seven represent? in God's kingdom, and you said Completion, perfection. perfection. Right, and that's yeah. true. But the idea of perfection is the idea of mushlam. The idea of perfection is the idea of completion. So he's going to present to the world a perfect, complete kingdom to all the nations on the mountains of Judea and Samaria. And he will reign in the midst of that, and that's the millennial kingdom. Now, again, the nations will walk by its light. So the nations are in existence. The Christian concept of the end of the world as we know, the end of the world, and that, that, is, that is wrong. And that comes from the whole pre-tribulation contraption. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been beating up on that quite a bit lately because I see where evangelicals are getting all pumped up. Their, their, their rapture juices are flowing, right? I got nothing again. I want the rapture. The rapture is going to happen. There's no question about it. But when and why? That's, that's, right. that's, that's the issue. When and why? When is it going to happen? It's going to happen according to Jesus following this great tribulation. Clear. Matthew chapter 24, you can't miss it. But why is it happening? It's happening because God wants to establish in the earth a royal priesthood of a people beyond, beyond perfect but supreme. I use the word supreme. A people who are perfect in their creation, uh, an example of the new creation to come. Whatever, whatever Jesus represented when he was resurrected and presented himself to his disciples is how we will resurrect. He is the first fruits. We are that harvest. So whatever he was when he was resurrected on that morning, we will be. And how many of us? Potentially millions upon millions of us will reign in the earth on behalf of the great king. That's the story. That's the story of the millennial kingdom. So it's not the end of the world. It's not this dreadful ending to, 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 to humanity. Humanity will live on. Those who persist in, in unrighteousness, they will not. He will smite them with the rod of his mouth. He will slay the wicked. That's just the reality of Jesus. So... I admire uh, Mar Mari Emmanuel. I admire him. Before this happened, I, I followed him a bit. We don't agree on everything, naturally, but, but I, I, I like his boldness I, because I think I'm bold as well. I mean, I, I don't have the same platform that he had. Uh, you know, I, didn't get invite, I don't get invited to big uh, podcasts. We have our own <laughs> podcast, and we're followed by 200 people. But... <laughs> I think it's a little more than that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. But, but I don't have the same platform, and so you might say, well, I can be bolder to address Islam or to address Hinduism or any of these other isms, and I do. But 
for now, we're not threatened. We've been threatened before. I've been threatened before. But for now, I feel like, I feel like we can carry the word on. Uh, pray for Ma Mari Emmanuel that he will become even more bold. Of course, they're going to have to up their um, security. security. Mm -hmm. uh, but he will become more bold. He has a tremendous platform. And what has happened is going to give him an even more incredible platform. So I want to encourage our listeners... If I can figure out what camera to look at, <laughs> I, want to, I want to encourage our listeners to know that we do live in a pivotal, a pivotal time in all of history. This is the time of all times, as, as I've said before, and God is preparing a lavish banquet, a quanta Isaiah, on his mountain. And all the nations will feast from it. It's going to be a time of, of abundance, a fruitful time. It says there in Isaiah chapter 11 that the natural, the branch, will bear fruit. The fruit that's being referred to there is the effects of the millennial kingdom. When Jesus, Messiah Yeshua, will reign in the earth with a royal priesthood, Israel, the nation of Israel, which we hadn't mentioned uh, its position during the millennial kingdom, but Israel will be there, squarely appointed in the place that God has appointed them to be to be that nation, that leading nation of all the nations. Again, we said that the nations will be in existence. The nations will have a big brother. And that big brother is God's firstborn of the nations, which is Israel. That's clear. In Exodus, in the first part of Exodus, we see that. God made a declaration to, to Pharaoh, let my firstborn go. And his firstborn was Israel. And the point of that is to say this, that the nation of Israel was and is and will be God's firstborn. Big brother to all the nations. A leader to all the nations that will follow after them and follow after Yeshua. This is what the millennial kingdom holds for us. So I want you to see this. I, I want you to study this. If you have questions about what I just said, feel free to pose those questions to me. I'm accessible. Um, you can find, you can get a hold of me through the website. And I'll answer your questions. I think we live in a very critical time where, where, where and when such questions as this are becoming more relevant and more important. So our goal here is to edify those who would listen, to edify you and to glorify God, which I hope we do. So God bless you. <laughs> That's our program. If the questions that have been addressed raise other questions in your thinking, you are welcome to share them with us. The easiest way to do that is to email us at voice at buildupzion.org. Again, that's voice at buildupzion.org. We are hosting a meeting with Rabbi Jeremy Gimpel on Sunday evening, May 26th at 7 p.m. You are welcome to come to that. We, we pray everyone have a wonderful Passover this next Monday evening. And until next week, Shalom. Shalom. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah.